Good morning. Today's session of Echo Voices is with Carrie Huddleston. Did I say that correctly? Oh, fantastic. Okay. She's going to be talking about powering up your AAC and dealing with challenging behaviors and AAC. And Carrie, I am going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to you. You are muted. Yeah, good morning, everybody. All right. Good morning. Really happy to be with you guys. And then uh, also to learn um, all about the things that you are doing with AAC. I'm going to see if I can change you so that I can. Uh, there we go. There we go. All right. I wasn't able to um, see there for a second. Um, so yeah, good morning. Um, I'm here to talk this morning about AAC and um, add on to all of the dedication and work that you've been doing and learning and benefits that you've been doing with your students with AAC, that focus, which is wonderful, um, that you've been working on all year, and then address issues related to challenging behavior. Um, this is you know, a shorter session, so I really wanna focus on things that we can do immediately to uh, benefit our students and to amp up our practices related to their AAC and challenging behavior. So just a little bit about me. I am a speech language pathologist um, and also an assistive technology specialist. I've been in the field for about 30 years, known Kelly for a super long time. I spent 25 years in the public schools. I just retired a few years ago. And so I definitely understand what it is like to provide services in the schools. So the bulk of my career was as an assistive technology specialist. And I went around to help teams in a very large school district, very large geographical area to make decisions about AT and get people People, the materials, resources, and training that they needed in a collaborative consultative model. But I also, for over 25 years, have been a national presenter and a consultant for states and districts and, and so on. I do provide now uh, in my retirement do a lot of uh, virtual training, but also I pr um, provide services when people need outside assistive technology um, assessments or independent assessments. So I have some experience doing that. I'm also a university professor. I teach disability issues at UNR, um, so University of Nevada, Reno. And I'm also a yoga teacher. We won't have any time for that this morning, unfortunately. And I'm an avid outdoor enthusiast. So, you know, sometimes people think of Reno as uh, being uh, like a casino town, but it's a great place to live if you love the outdoors, which I do. So our objectives this morning is looking at all of the AAC practices that we have and integrating that with positive behavioral supports. And I think what's exciting to do that is a lot of the people that we might be supporting or working with are probably going to be familiar with a positive behavioral support model. And so how do we really bring that into our AAC practice and make sure that those are coming together for maximum benefit for the students? And as we go through this morning, I want us to take a step back and just really consider the reality of our current practices and what is going on in the environment for the students. Because a lot of times it can be very straightforward barriers that um, end up being quite significant for our students with challenging behavior that use AAC. And so I'm gonna give you five strategies this morning that you can uh, take away and look at and start to evaluate and make change right away. Again, sometimes it's the very simple solutions. And of course, also forcing people uh, to do what you want them to do, always a primary objective. So, <laughs> all right. So I just want us to have a moment to be honest this morning about what we see for our kids with challenging behavior. And I wanna start by saying that I know that it is not easy out there. Having spent 25 years in the public schools, I know what it's like to provide services uh, in that context. And right now people are under a lot of pressure. I know that um, where you guys are, there are shortages and people having to cover extra duties and that kind of thing. And it's very much the same situation where I live in Nevada. And so I, I've lived that and I still do as I support um, districts and, and people all over, all over the country, but also locally when I'm doing those independent um, assessments as well. So I just want to acknowledge the actual state of things. No, no pie in the sky from me this morning. So as we start out, I think it's important to just, again, acknowledge where we are as professionals. When we are helping students with challenging behaviors, 
Um, I think we can all agree that it's important to kind of check in with ourselves and where we are at, including with our own self-regulation, because those students with challenging behaviors can really pick up on how we are doing very, very quickly. So I made for you guys this morning just a five-point scale. So we'll start our day with a little self-regulation exercise for ourselves, and just be honest about where we're at so that we can apply the right strategies to get us in the zone where we where we would like to be. So for you guys, you know, maybe at that, maybe you're at that one level where you're saying to yourself, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I have what I need. I've got the materials that I need. You know, I'm super pumped about challenging behavior. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to work with that population and um, for AAC. So maybe we're feeling pretty solid and maybe we're just looking for strategies that we can use to help other people. Or maybe you're at that level two where it's like, oh, I'm, I am excited. I am able to keep being excited, but um, I'm just also doing my best to juggle the many, many things that I have to do. And that's an okay place to be. We're feeling maybe a little overwhelmed, or maybe we're starting to reach a frustration level. And that could be with our own practices, just with all of the things that we need to do and, and helping kids with challenging behavior, or maybe it's helping other people who are helping uh, kids with challenging behavior. Or maybe we're at this place that of, all right, I'm doing what I can, but it is a lot. And we can just acknowledge that, okay, that's where we're at. And then maybe it's just like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. And again, maybe we're not just seeing that, maybe we're not just seeing that in ourselves, but we are seeing that in the other people that we are supporting. So once we know where we're at, we can kind of um, be able to apply the strategies that help us get into a better place, a more positive place. So I think it's important and we don't often get an opportunity to do this, to just allow ourselves to pause and take a step back and, and look at the situation as a whole for our kids with AAC and challenging behavior. And then to remember that you know, we have a lot of knowledge, the people that we work with have a lot of knowledge. And so how can we take a minute, pause, step back and tap into what we already know? And just looking at the reality of the situation and seeing what basics might be missing so that we can apply our knowledge. So the case study that I'm going to focus on today, and um, as I said to Chandra earlier, you know, where, where there's this one case study, there are hundreds more that um, I have encountered over the course of my career. But as we, as we go through this session, I want to bring up the case of Sam. So I encountered Sam first when he was referred uh, to the assistive technology team for just general kinds of supports, including communication. His parents, uh, there was a little bit of um, uh, conflict between the school team, things that were going on, and then a parent request for a speech generating device. And so my job was to come in and get everybody to the table and figure out um, how to make good decisions for Sam. So Sam has uh, autism. Uh, complex communication needs, so it um, does not communicate uh, verbally, and then also some uh, challenging behaviors that were pretty significant. So in kindergarten, he was in a full day program, but he was in a kindergarten half day, and then half of the day he was in uh, what we call strategies here, which is our classroom for students with autism spectrum disorder and uh, with a specialized uh, teacher. So half the day regular kindergarten, half the day that strategies program. So a significant part of his education was a very, very intensive um, ABA and, and uh, mainly focusing on discrete trials. So rather than things like pivotal response, it was mainly that, that very rote discrete trial teaching. And that was something that his family was very on board with. And, and we had a big team of behaviorists providing that instruction. So at all times, he had a one-to-one -one person with him. So whether that's a behavior tech or an aide, so a lot of people surrounding uh, this little kindergartner. And so what often happened, even though he's in an inclusive uh, kindergarten, he's often separated from the students. So at a table, like at a kidney table, away from the students with that one-to-one -one instruction, receiving uh, his discrete trial training uh, kind of program. And that, that was also in his uh, strategies program as well. So he's in these environments, but he's separated. So again, his team included a board certified behavior analysts, a number of behavior techs, speech language pathologist, occupational therapist. He also had adaptive PE services. Um, he had a strategies teacher, so that specialized teacher, and then a general education teacher. 
And by the way, Chandra, am I on the recording or am I just, do I have you? <laughs> Oh, no, you're on the recording. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. I see you. Okay, I just want to make sure. So um, again, he's got a, um, a, a number of people on his team and of course, a general education teacher who was wonderful, by the way, uh, in that kindergarten program. So some of the supports that he had available to him, given his behavioral needs, his educational needs, and also his AAC, was uh, they were using uh, PEC, so Picture Exchange Communication System with him uh, at the time. He also, they had done a preference inventory, had a number of items and reinforcers to help him, and a token economy for as he's moving through his discrete trial training. So I want to give you just a little bit more context as we look at him. So when I, when I observed uh, Sam, and I'm in his classroom, so whether that was the kindergarten or that strategy separated program, he was not doing the same curriculum as the other students. He's like working, like they're working on something and he's got a parallel, not even parallel because he's working on this discrete trial, but a, se a separate program. And he had little to no interaction with the kids. So little, little to no interaction with that kindergarten curriculum. So his his family was very much uh, in support of his inclusive um, his inclusive program, but then again wanted this intense uh, discrete trial teaching with him. So you could see that these are kind of at odds, right? And so when I was looking at his IEP goals, and then I'm looking at the environment that he was in and doing kind of a matrix to look at how these things blended, they kind of, they really didn't blend. Um, and so because he was in a separate part, so you've got kids, you know, you know, kindergarten, so kids running around. And, um, and then in strategies, you know, kids uh, even working together in groups, but um, he was not essentially a part of the class. So in analyzing his behaviors, his primary behaviors were escape um, and then also to obtain attention. So you can imagine he's a, in a separate place. There's other things happening and he would want some attention. Uh, and so then he would be redirected into that discrete trial program. And so then he would also want to obtain tangible. So again, imagine him uh, in this classroom. There's kids grabbing a book, going to the circle time, going to different environments in the classroom. And he was not, uh, did not have access to those materials. And then his communication, because of them, uh, they were following a pretty strict PECS protocol, was highly directed. So he he did not have any kind of aided language stimulation or modeling using AAC, no access to regular core vocabulary. And so the people in the environment not really uh, using that with him, just a very strict um, program for, for him. So as we think about Sam, and you can start to um, you know bring forward the students that you're working with with challenging behaviors and AAC, um, I think it's important to kind of stay out of the weeds, right? So you could just imagine in this scenario that I've just described, if we step back for a second, we could probably already see some glaring issues for him in terms of having quality AAC. But sometimes as busy professionals, again, we don't get to hit that pause button, just step back because we're all you know, caught in the weeds of, oh, he's got a BCBA and he's got this highly directed program and it's discrete trial, but let's pause and let's step back and look at the basics first. And how is Sam set up for communication uh, and learning? And you can probably think of where I'm going to go with this. So as we move through this presentation, and I bring up some of these um, places where we can step back and look at what's happening. I want you to ask yourself, as you look at your students, are these basics and are these essential components of behavior and AAC really in place? Like, do we have, evidence. We can go into a student's classroom. We can look at their program and go, oh yeah, th that strategy is really evident. I can give that an E. Maybe it's partially evident. So maybe in one uh, context, the student uh, has some of these things that are evident in the services that he's receiving. You know, some of the times we might call that partially evident. And then I don't like to use the word like not evident. That's why it looks like New Year's Eve, um, because it's just we're looking at strategies that are not yet evident, but we want them to be evident. So it's OK if they're not yet evident, but then we can move uh, towards those practices. So real growth is rooted in honest reflection. So the first strategy I want to think about is just taking that wide angle lens. We've got a student with challenging behavior, AAC uh, needs, a little bit of uh, AAC materials or strategies, but let's take a step back and look at that wider view as a place to begin. 
So when we have a student with challenging behavior, so much of the time, I feel like the microscope or the magnifying glass goes like right on that kid that has that challenging behavior. So, you know, to me, a kid is a kid is a kid, right? So we have a challenging behaviors. Sure. But let's step back pan out and look at the bigger picture, because that's often where I find essential things are missing and uh, some basic things to focus on before we pan in, you know, try to uh, hone in and just look at that student. So where do we start? Well, um, start with the adults. So, you know, for me, when I think about augmentative communication, you know, the kids are going to come along. If we're using good strategies, uh, we're using good AAC teaching, those kids are going to get on board. Um, but the adults, sometimes it's a little bit harder to kind of look at how do I get the adults on board because I won't have a successful um, AAC intervention with a student, successful behavioral intervention with a student if I don't look at the adults first. So when I look at the adults too, I think, okay, first of all, especially in specialized programs, so I think about Sam's teacher in the strategies program. She was a very, she is a very gifted teacher and uh, she took herself to um, training. She uh, went to, uh, for example, teach years ago and tried to implement uh, those kinds of strategies, a little bit uh, more uh, naturalistic, but highly structured, you know, program for the students, but her curriculum, she basically had to invent herself. And I see this so much of the time when I look at especially self-contained teachers. So when I'm thinking about students with challenging behavior and augmentative communication needs, I start there and say, okay, do we even have a curriculum that um, is workable for this teacher that is meeting the student's needs? Because maybe there's a place, even as an assistive technology specialist, I can help to start looking at kind of some global uh, tools and supports um, and help advocate for getting the curriculum uh, that the student, that the teacher needs. So not my job to provide the curriculum, but I can advocate for that and making sure that those, those adults are actually trained. Um, and so, and that they're feeling a positive, that they have some, some input. And so many times I see uh, educators and they're just dumped upon. And so can't, are, are they given an opportunity to share their creativity input and that they are valued and respected because I can't get good positive behavioral supports on strategy and strategies in place if people don't come uh, to the table and feel respected to share their point of view. So to me, before we ask adults to take responsibility for behavior in AAC, I want to look at their needs and are their needs being met. So Sam's kindergarten teacher, let's start there. Again, she is wonderful. She is an amazing kindergarten teacher. And I know that at one point, once we started to look at um, different AAC strategies beyond those uh, that discrete trial um, kind of uh, PECS approach, I got everybody to the table. And one of the things that happened with her was I started asking her questions questions um, about her curriculum, what's important to her, what's her vision for Sam. And, and then I remember telling her, you know, you're the star of the show. And pretty much all the rest of us are here to provide those services so that Sam has maximum access to you because you are the general education teacher. And so just even in that, um, in that conversation, it empowered her like I can't she was amazing and she really wanted Sam to come into her classroom to be a part of that group. So I look at the adults and their needs first when it comes to behavior because relationships matter. I cannot address challenging behavior unless I'm helping to foster good relationships and the same with communication. So I need confident, positive adults with the tools they need, because then that fosters happy learning kids and the challenging behaviors, of course, go down. So I know that in talking to Deb and Chandra, you know, looking at after the pandemic, many of our students have had um, have been isolated. Some of them pulled out of school, have maybe lost some of their skills. And, and then um, many of my students with challenging behaviors can come from um, very, very challenging backgrounds, even traumatic backgrounds. So when I think about challenging behavior and working with the adults is to have, have developed that understanding that, you know, school is has to be a desirable place, a place 
place where people believe in you. And so when my when I'm dealing with students with challenging behavior, again, I have to check in with my own uh, nervous system. How am I doing? And making sure that that kid knows that I'm going to believe in them no matter what. And getting um, Sam's team on board. And that was really once people had the opportunity to say, yeah, I'm here for him. I will believe in him no matter what. They just needed the opportunity to say that. So uh, moving forward, I want to then just look at the features of PBIS, so Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, and AAC, and how they blend uh, together. So what are some fundamental concepts of PBIS that support AAC? And what I love about PBIS, again, is many people, many professionals in the school system are educated on PBIS. And so when we start um, connecting those dots with, hey, how does this go with AAC? This is knowledge you already have. Um, and let's put that together with our AAC strategies. So, and again, as we move through this, I want you to look at that. Am I seeing this as evident in my practice for students with challenging behaviors and AAC? First of all, positive. When I go into that environment, is that actually uh, what I'm seeing? Is that clearly evident? That there's a consideration of environment and context. So, one environment and context in that kindergarten classroom, one environment and context isolated kind of like with the with the one to one instruction. And then how does that work with the with the um, uh, self-contained environment as well? And then, of course, in PBIS, we view challenging behavior as communicative. And of course, with AAC, we try to adjust the communication in a more positive way. But people already know about this and that when that student is using a behavior to communicate, we look at that in a function based way to meet an unmet need. For example, Sam and attention. He had an unmet need to participate in that class and get attention with his teacher, with his peers. And that is just part of that PBIS approach. And then that when we look at his individual interventions, his individual behavior plan, does it really address the function of this behavior? So with that token economy, for example, if he wants the attention because he wants to be with those students, he wants to be with his teacher. So is that token economy board, for example, actually meeting the need of attention? Or is it that we can use AAC for a new way for Sam to communicate that need for attention, that that token economy and that um, and his ability to use, uh, you know, to be able to request cheese with his PECS board isn't really going to meet that need of attention uh, from his teacher or his classmates. So we can ask ourselves, is this what we're really seeing when we go through this list? Is there evidence that all these things are in place? And then you're going to hear me say this repeatedly. Um, there's this thing it's called, oh, yeah, teaching. And so when we think about positive behavioral support strategies, we can't, we, as we know, we can't just put them in place. We have to teach that replacement behavior. And that sometimes can be um, a little bit of a lengthy process, although I find that if we find that immediate support. So, for example, if I need help and I'm banging on the table and then I have a device that says, help, then and I might be able to pretty quickly change that behavior. But it has to be, of course, taught. So now let's think about features of quality AAC. And I know you guys have been really focused on this over the year. So when we think about AAC, and this is the same with challenging behavior. So challenging behavior often masks cognition. It often masks ability to communicate. And so presuming competence, which we know is so important with AAC, is just as critical when we are looking at challenging behavior. And so sometimes just being able to communicate that that's the same, even when those extreme behaviors might be masking that competence, we still presume competence. And then, of course, challenging behaviors um, you know, even little tiny kids that I work with, there can be a lot of negative assumptions made because of, you know, and I've had kids that do a range of challenging behaviors, anywhere from throwing their poop across the room to throwing things to leaving to, you know, um, I'll withdraw the whole gamut um, of challenging behaviors. But you can think about how that kind of challenging behavior is going to mask the potential um, and, and even the cognition of students that have those kinds of behaviors. So we make the least harmful assumptions and just like PBIS, we have to consider the environment and context uh, that we are functioning in. And uh, wow, look at this, positive. So positive PBIS, positive strategies with AAC because AAC gives us that new pro-social way to meet our needs. So for Sam, 
has that need for attention, we can see how AAC is going to have, help us to interact and develop a relationship with his teacher and with the students in his classroom. And of course, we know that um, AAC systems must be available at all times. So go think right now of a kid that you're working with with challenging behavior, then there's a simple strategy. Is that, are there systems, are there tools, materials, and supports available at all times? Can we say that with confidence? And do they have access to robust vocabulary? So when I go into Sam's situation, the answer to that question is no. Um, just some basic uh, kinds of uh, wants or requests does not the kind of robust vocabulary that's going to help uh, Sam to develop language so that he can use that speech generating device that um, um, we want to uh, move uh, forward to. And are there a variety of communicative functions represented? So when I looked at his situation, the answer to that question is no, that is not evident. He is a very, very uh, basic kinds of communicative functions, mainly requests. And so obviously it's like he could be, he got his uh, you know discrete trial training program, like he, he understood all that. He knew uh, how to follow the program and get his little tokens and so on. But in terms of motivating, what was motivating for him was to benefit from that inclusive classroom and to uh, try to be with other kids and his teacher. So making sure that when we look at that situation, does he really have access to autonomous communication? But in his, um, with his behavior people, they wanted him to say a particular thing or only wanted him to say a certain body of things. And you can imagine how that escalates that challenging behavior. If I don't even have the opportunity to say something different, um, I want something different, then um, that creates already an escalation in challenging behavior. So just looking at that, when you're thinking about your kids, evident, partially evident, not yet evident. Oh my gosh, I'm talking about adults again. So we know that through, um, through training, support, input, creativity, and collaboration, when students or when adults learn to be augmentative communicators, then the kids will come along. You know, so often I'll go into a classroom, uh, just like in Sam's classroom. So I am uh, a pod user. So I take my pragmatically organized dynamic dynamic display book with me wherever I go. And then I just walk in and, uh, you know, often start talking to myself and the kids, you know, I call it fishing for kids. The kids will start kind of doing drive-bys and wonder what I'm up to. And um, next thing you know, they might be interested in communication. Same uh, in the situation with Sam. So first I improve and the kids will come along. And then, you know, sometimes the, the, um, the, P, the staff will think that, um, you know, I'm some kind of communication whisperer, but that isn't, you know, the, that isn't the truth. It's just being perceptive and having a system. So I have a system. I want my adults to have a system so that we can um, be competent augmentative communicators and use all those good strategies we know are beneficial for getting kids to use AAC, curiosity, patience, persistence, reinforcement, modeling. And so again, think about the situation that your kids are in that have challenging behaviors. And then what do you see? Evident? Partially evident, not yet evident. Are is everyone in the environment really coming along to learn to be a competent AAC user themselves? And of course, teaching and more teaching. And so, um, when we think about devices, and I know that Kelly's providing you really good information with how to make some choices with features of different devices, and those are really important factors. But when we think about AAC. A lot of times people are focused on materials and equipment, including families and some staff members. And the stuff eventually, you know, that is very important, but we're not going to do well with the stuff. We'll have a high rate of abandonment if we don't get the adults on board to be competent AAC users. And then, you know, I say this acknowledging that the teachers are very overwhelmed. And so making sure that, um, again, this is a collaboration, a work in progress, for us to come together for me to empower you, um, including, uh, for example, Sam's kindergarten teacher. And so a lot of times people, like, and so in her case, she was just getting steamrolled, you know, by, by um, very, very strong uh, consultants and behaviorists and so on. And so that was a big barrier. When I look at real barriers for kids, that was a big barrier. Um, and so we can imagine why people don't feel valued 
and how hard it's going to be, especially in the face of very challenging circumstances. We have kids with complex communication needs and challenging behavior. So again, I focus on the adults. That's the important part. And also um, when I think about other related service providers like Sam's speech language pathologist, also getting kind of steamrolled uh, you know, so her, she was very um, good with augmentative communication. So part of my job is to come in and advocate and get her to the table because she had a lot of knowledge to give. And then also the paraprofessionals. So much of the time I see with paraprofessionals that um, they're not necessarily uh, included or they're just kind of uh, dumped on their own without the supports and structure they need. And when we think about challenging behaviors in AAC, uh, you know, uh, the more the more structure, especially with our paraprofessionals, the more successful they're going to be. So. Uh, the third strategy I want to go into is just making sure that we take a step back and look that we're actually being proactive. So anytime we're talking about positive behavioral supports interventions or AAC, we know we have to set kids up for success from the beginning. We can't be in a reactive state of, oh, now um, Sam has lost it. Let me go find Sam's communication device. Instead, we have to put that energy at the front end and people are exhausted and this is sometimes hard to do, but kids with challenging behavior are going to get your attention one way or another. So it's either on the back end or we're going to work on that front end. And that is the whole PBIS um, approach and the whole um, uh, quality AAC approach. So making sure that we're setting everyone up for success, including if that paraprofessional was Sam, uh, not with his behavior people, but with his paraprofessional, does she have the tools and supports uh, that she needs or is she just uh, left with time alone without uh, what she needs and the structure and training uh, and information to be successful? So we all get to decide where we're going to spend our units of energy. So a lot of times I'll hear that nobody has time for this. But, you know, what's the alternative? Again, I sometimes I will ask people, do you love meetings? Um, because that's an option. Uh, we can look at that PBIS, do our best to set that kid up, because otherwise we are going to end up in a lot of meetings. And that often does not have the best outcome for kids uh, rather than setting them up for success. You can tell I'm a letter Kenny fan because I had to put this up. You know, if you could be one thing, uh, you should be efficient. So again, when we think about kids with complex communication needs and challenging behavior, we have to ask ourselves, is it evident? Do we walk into the classroom or are we in the classroom setting them up and are they front load, but for like real though? Not that there's just proximity to an augmentative communication device, but that that is um, at their disposal and there are knowledgeable adults uh, in the room to help them. And are the staff front loaded? Is that paraprofessional front loaded, but like for real though? Like if I step back, I can say, yes, I have evidence that that paraprofessional has the tools of confidence support that she needs um, to, to help Sam with his AAC and with um, his, his positive behavioral interventions and supports. So we know that before we, again, put that magnifying glass on a kid, what are the general steps that we can take before we hone in and focus on that student? And so we think of any kind of like response to intervention or we think of a PBIS model and we think of tiers or pyramids and we want to start from those general interventions and then move to the, the more specific for that student. And so when you look at that, if you walk in or you're it's in your classroom, you know, can't do we have evidence that the general things are put in place? So think about Sam. Well, you know, he is a student with autism and like many of uh, our students with autism respond really well to uh, being front loaded with information about transitions, being front loaded uh, with information about what to do, being provided um, with visual supports for his recept receptive vocabulary. Um, and, and so when we think about those general things that are in place, we can just step back and go, OK, before I put that magnifying glass on the fact that he's you know kind of losing it over here are these things actually in place? Um, so when we think about, you know, I gave you guys a five point scale this morning, you know, are those, uh, we know that students with autism are going to need help with self-regulation a lot of the time, those receptive language supports again, what are the expectations and, you know, the highly neglected executive functioning that is so important. So when I think about any kid that I have with challenging behavior, I'm going to go right to that executive functioning first and foremost. And are those AAC materials and strategies truly integrated? 
So then the next step is to look at who is actually providing. I keep saying teaching, teaching, teaching. And so who is providing that direct skills teaching? And so when we think about our students, so we have, they're having challenging behavior, they have those AAC needs. We have to remember that it is unethical to punish students for not having skills that we have failed to teach them. So that is an unethical practice. So when we look at Sam and that challenging behavior of trying to get attention from his teacher, trying to move, escape his work situation and get to those other students, we and then he's just brought back or given um, some kind of consequence uh, or or not allowed to have that pro social communication. We have to look at uh, is that an ethical thing to do? He's communicating something with that challenging behavior, but we have not taught him the skill of how to go to circle time and be near his friends that he really wants to go to. And that is where we need to make sure we focus our attention. So we have to say, does he really have the skills to do what we want and to meet the actual function of that behavior? And somebody has to teach that. So it's not when we think about who's going to teach that direct skill, you know, we have it's not going to be appropriate for that kindergarten teachers motivated as she was to do that direct skills teaching. But in his case, we've got a lot of people at his disposal so we can decide who is going to teach what skill and then have everybody work together because we need teaching, teaching. And then, of course, there's always teaching. So to be effective and defensible as well, when we think about PBIS and AAC, these are situations sometimes that can get extraordinarily contentious. So I have, for example, testified in due process, uh, unfortunately, on several occasions. And often the, the cases in which I've been called to do that are when there's conflict between the school district um, and families and most of the time there are students with uh, challenging behaviors and I've uh, many times done that for uh, mainly mediation, not too many due process um, about uh, AAC as well. So when we go to defend our practices and, and looking at PBIS and AAC, again, step back, we have to ask ourselves, do we have evidence of these things that we know are necessary for uh, both, both aspects of what we're talking about today? So do I have evidence that there's modeling, practice, rehearsal, that there's feedback? I have inform I have data about that, that we can show that there's reinforcement for looking at that, for that new skill of, of being able to move to circle time, being able to get my teacher's attention. And is there support for generalization? So when we step back again, I'm, I'm still don't have my magnifying glass on Sam because I have to be able to show that, hey, we're look. And in order to effectively analyze my practices, is there ev can I provide evidence that these things are happening for implementation? Because when a student is not progressing, of course, we do not blame the lettuce. So this comes from Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, maybe some of you know him. Um, he passed away, but as a, a Zen Buddhist uh, Vietnamese monk. And so this is something that, uh, this is a quote from him. When you plant the lettuce, if it does not grow well, you do not blame the lettuce. So again, when I'm, I'm gonna get my magnifying glass off Sam, I'm gonna step back, I'm gonna look at these practices and I'm gonna look to that there is actually evidence that we are doing these necessary things. So then those are, you know, as we move then uh, from those more global kinds of aspects and we start honing in on Sam's particular needs, and I have seen a lot of behavior plans in my time. Um, I have provided uh, input for many of them, uh, and some of them uh, have been useful and some of them have not been useful. So I want you to think about the behavior plans that are in place when we start addressing those specific behaviors, for example, the ones that Sam had. And then making sure that the, it's called a positive behavioral support plan like for a reason, um, because it's supposed to be what they call positive. And so sometimes when I look at them, they aren't necessarily positive. So these are some typical problems that I see when I'm looking at behavior plans for students. For one thing, it lives uh, in the IEP folder. And so it's very, when I'm going into a classroom with a kid with a challenging behavior, I need to know what their behavior plan says. So I wanna make sure I'm conducting myself in the appropriate manner. I know what their challenging behaviors are. I know what the protocol is. I know most of all what positive behavioral supports I need to um, be uh, making sure that I'm not only offering, but implementing with the students. 
So if it lives in the IEP folder, which a lot of times I see that happening, that's going to be very difficult for me um, to be able to participate. And it's, of course, important for adults to be on board. And then the other thing I see is that it's not implemented or not implemented consistently. So um, maybe the kindergarten teacher is implementing, but the behavior people have gone rogue and they're kind of doing their own thing. So um, we can uh, we need to make sure that it's actually being implemented uh, consistently across uh, all people. Or sometimes I've seen interventions not appropriate in the school setting. I had a kid once that used to get five dollar Starbucks cards. Uh, on his uh, PBIs, like on the regular, some behavior uh, people came in to suggest that. So I don't know what your school budget is, um, but that's a kind of an unsustainable practice. Uh, one time I had a student with um, that was uh, on the ASD spectrum and they recommended uh, on an outside behavior person, some equine assisted therapy. So that's going to be pretty challenging. Uh, I mean, I do live here in the West. We have more horses than elsewhere, but that's not necessarily a very reasonable uh, thing to put in a behavior plan. I still see sometimes that behavior plans are based on consequences or punishment. And of course we know that, that um, the research shows that that is not effective and that is not what the law requires us to do. And then um, when it comes to augmentative communication, really think about this with your students, that that new communication does not meet the same need as the challenging behavior. So if I want to escape my situation because I want to go to that circle time, I need a new communication that is going to meet the same need of escape. It's not going to be a request for cheese because that does not mean meet my need for escape. And I see this still all of the time. And then also that the child is not taught because we need to, of course, teach, teach and teach and then revise because those, you know, those darn children go changing all the time. So and then when we're looking at this at their positive behavior report, uh, support plan that is positive, Here's some things to look at, evident, partially evident, not yet evident. Of course, we want it to primarily focus on, so when I think of the, the when I look at a positive behavioral support plan, I wanna see about this much positive behavioral support center in this, you know, in place, and about this much consequences, right? Or how we're supposed to react uh, if the child has a, a real uh, outburst of challenging behavior. So most of all, front loading. And it identifies those specific skills to be taught. So if we're learning a new function of a behavior to escape, then we have uh, in that behavior plan, how are we teaching how to use our AAC for escape? And it specifies that it, and so I really want you to think about the behavior plans you have. Does that new communication with AAC really honestly meet the same function of that behavior? And, and again, those behaviors change over time. Is there any kind of revision that we need to do um, and, and keep that at the, at the forefront of our mind at, at all times? And of course, whatever that AAC strategy is that we're using, it's got to be more effective. So um, whatever uh, for Sam, for him to be able to go to circle time and to be able, of course, we can, his positive behavioral support strategies are, of course, that he has a schedule, including in that schedule, the circle time with friends with um, everything he needs to be able to participate and sit in a squishy seat to move around and all of the things that he needs to be able to participate, but also teaching him that um, that uh, augmentative communication strategy. But it has to be more efficient. If I'm more efficient banging on the table to get that response for help than using my AAC device to say help, then I'm going to bang on the table every time. Um, and I, I know for myself, the function of my behavior uh, is always escapes. <laughs> um, if I don't have a, a good, uh, a more efficient strategy, she's out. Um, so uh, again, that this positive behavioral support plan idea identifies the specific strategies also, because we can do everything that we can to set the child up for success. And sometimes we're going to have a behavior occur anyway. And so what are our what are our strategies for dealing with that behavior if it occurs and we've done all that we said we were going to do. And then it identifies those self regulation de escalation strategies for the kid. So when you think about the behavior plans you have access to for your students, ask yourself, okay, I'm going to give it the walk in test. So if uh, Chandra comes to the classroom tomorrow, I'm gonna give her the walk-in test. Is this gonna be pretty easy for Chandra to understand how to set Sam up for success with his positive behavioral supports um, and with his AAC? So evident, partially evident, not yet evident in terms of 
give it that walk-in test. And then it's easy to reference and that it is shared with everybody that needs to be shared with, including, let's say, the playground aid. So then that the plan is actually utilized and does not live in a drawer. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of some forms I created, and then I'll be wrapping it up for questions here. And these are some resources that if you are interested in them, I'm happy to provide them so that you can have access. And one is just a, a behavior cue card. So a quick way to have that walk-in test so people can have access to the information they need. And then an accountability form. Did we do what we actually said we were going to do? And if we did, you know, that's going to help us revise that behavior plan. So this is just a um, just a simple way. So it's not the full behavior plan. I can um, I keep this pretty confidential for Sam, for example. So I have a behavior cue card and everybody who's going to encounter him can have access to how we set Sam up for success, especially if at any time we are going to have responsibility for Sam ourselves. What do we do in case of an escalation? So first of all, on that behavior cue card. Yeah, I've read the whole IEP. So not just part of the IEP, I have read the entire IEP and I have read the full behavior plan. But on this form, we can just say, okay, before, as we set up the student, including his AAC strategies, what are the positive behavioral supports that are supposed to be in place? So I've got my schedule, I've got my visual instructions, I've got my augmentative communication device, um, I've got my teaching strategies I, that people are going to be using with me. And then to know what are Sam's possible um, uh, behaviors, like running out of the classroom, for example. And if that happens, what should you do? What's one, two, three? What are the steps? And then what are the signs of escalation I should look for in Sam? So hopefully I can offset that challenging behavior. But I'm going to, um, as a person coming in, I'm consulting, I'm working with Sam. I want to know, oh, okay, these are some signs that Sam's starting to get a little worked up. So that then I can maybe use some of my self-regulation strategies or that are in place for him um, as we before we get to a five, which some of you may be at, so I can bring him on back down. And so I need to know immediately what is it that I'm looking for. And then if it all breaks loose, what do I do? First step, second step, third step. Okay, now we're in a crisis situation. Who do I call? Um, and then the next form, as I said, uh, is an accountability checklist. And again, we might do all of the things and find that he still is having um, some challenging behavior that we need to address. Well, this is going to help us have that information to say, hey, you know what? The AAC was there. We do the self-regulation strategies. He's got um, his visual schedule. Um, he's got his, all of his executive functioning supports. We And we did all of the things and he still had um, this extreme challenging behavior. So when we think about that, that's gonna give us data and information. And remember when I say defensible, we want to be able to show that. So this is just a, um, a simple form that we can get together. So no blame, we're just gonna look. And if, and if we haven't put those things in place, well, we've got work to do. We need to make sure that next time all of those things are in place. All right, so how can you help? Well, one thing, just give yourself some grace. These are challenging situations and what, what you guys do working in the schools, with, well, no matter what role you're in, um, uh, it isn't for the faint of heart, especially in the times that we're in. So um, I just um, invite everyone to uh, invite everybody else to just take a step back, hit that pause button. Remember that you do know a lot. And if we can just pause for a moment, we'll probably be able to solve some um, pretty significant problems just by tackling the basics first. Um, and, and being able to uh, take a moment to invite that collaboration, creativity to empower the people that we work with. And then um, I love working with kids with challenging behaviors uh, and complex communication needs. Um, my heart uh, just, just really fills my love bucket. And with all that we have to do, sometimes I think it's hard to just say pause and go, you know, and this is the one that, like I was ready to leave the school system for sure after 25 years, but the kids never have I um, uh I'm tired working with kids. That's why I still work with them. So uh, just having a moment to let those kids fill your love bucket. So a little quote before questions here, and this is uh, comes from Benjamin uh, Zander about shining eyes. My job is to awaken the possibility in other people. If their eyes are shining, you know you're doing it. If they're not shining, you get to ask this question. Who am I being that my children's eyes are not shining? And for our kids with challenging behaviors and AAC, again, that's what we're out there to do. Just get those shining eyes. All right. And with that, um, I'm happy to take some questions.
All right. Well, that was, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Carrie? I know that we did have some comments in the chat. Okay. Um, I think some frustrations of okay. the, uh, the lack of information being shared with okay. all parties. Um, so thank you for, for that. And, um, so you can see that's why just even something like the behavior cue card or that accountability checklist, you can think about like just even those kinds of simple strategies, because I mean, people, they just don't have collaboration time. It's so hard to get that communication. And so the more we can simplify and streamline and get everybody kind of just accustomed to this, um, then, and I know that that's, that's kind of a daunting task. So, and I'm saying that having done it for 30 years, um, in a variety of situations. So I would encourage you because really, and I know that these situations can escalate quickly. Um, and so the more even simple information we have, the more defensible and targeted our practices are going to be, but I want to acknowledge that, that very real frustration. And the comment that you made, uh, Chandra and Joy, about um, your your role, uh, somebody who is an IA, an educational class assistant, uh, whatever we call them, uh, it doesn't get much training for anything. Uh, mm -hmm. And in Oregon, very little uh, happens and you don't know who's in your classroom until you show up the first day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they are often the ones who are uh, working directly with the kids with behaviors, but have the least amount of training to know what to do. But you know that. Yeah, but and so I'll tell you some things that I, um, so uh, if, when I talk about front loading, and I think of a paraprofessional who it is critical to front load. And so much of the time, they're just kind of like here. OK, well, we did this thing with this kid. Now you're sort of just like need to manage this kid um, and including kids with pretty uh, extreme challenging behaviors and that have augmentative communication needs. So when I think of escalation with the kids, I think executive functioning. Right. Uh, so uh, so like I use the hand model of the brain all the time. Maybe you guys use the hand model of the brain. I think I put a picture of you on your hand up. So when I think of the kids and their executive functioning, when they're, you know, like when they're reacting to something and they're they're not in that forefront of their uh, executive functioning, higher order uh, part of their brain, they flip their lid and we're in that reactive fight or flight kind of state. Well, I look at my adults and um, I see that all the time with them too. And so I've many times encountered volunteers uh, or staff members, paraprofessionals, and they have flipped their lid. Um, and so when I think about the hand model of the brain and I think, okay, so just like with the kids, we got to get our big feelings a hug and then come back online to our executive functioning. So what I like to do is take a, for paraprofessionals is how have I set their executive functioning up? So even something like this behavior cue card, for example, I often use a matrix. I'm a huge proponent of, I know you guys are working on a different kind of matrix, but so I work on a, I always provide a paraprofessional with a matrix. Here's the schedule. Here's the kids IEP goals. Here's the supports that go in these environments to meet these IEP goals so that you know we connect the dots. We're in this environment. We get out the support. Here's how we front load the kid. And here's your toolbox. And also, I'm going to come in and I'm going to show you. I'm going to walk the walk and not just expect that you're going to be able to do this without watching me do it. And make sure that because of more structure and information that you have, think about your kids. They're, they're less likely to flip their lid um, if they've got information and structure so that they can self-regulate. And it is the same for adults and they are so stressed out. So if for yourself, you know why you probably don't go uh, shopping for uh, the holidays to buy your groceries without a list and some structure and it's stressful out there. So for my paraprofessionals, must front load them with success. Um, and make sure if I have a positive behavioral support strategy, I have an AAC strategy, I'm there to model it and I'm going to give you um, written, uh, very specific information about what to do so I can keep you online. Wonderful. You can see I get, I get on a little platform. About that. I, guess I, I feel very passionate about it. <laughs> well, and I, I, I hear you saying that you, you have to help your adults first because mm -hmm. I know stressed out adults create stressed out kids. Yeah. I have a stressed out teenager. 
I'm a stressed <laughs> out mom. <laughs> well, and, and so, so, yeah, but a teenager is a good example. So if you think about toddlers, anything about teenagers, right? Um, and here's a, here's a couple of periods of time where there's like big bursts of development of executive functioning and very intense feelings. Um, and so um, when I think about toddlers and teenagers, both, and of course we give teenagers driver's license, you know, right when they're having very passionate feelings and they haven't developed all their executive functioning, highest order of attention required. But, um, but you know, so here's a couple of examples. I and mean, when we're not talking about people with disabilities where, you know, again, that structure self-regulation, learning skills, practice, reinforcement, generalization with support, then everybody, mom stays back online, a uh, teenager stays back online, um, because uh, those are those are great examples of how our brains function. So when I walk in and I'm seeing a kid who um, is really exhibiting serious, challenging behavior, that's where my brain is going to go first is, okay, how's everybody else doing around here? Um, and then where's our positive behavioral supports for us? So I think about positive behavioral supports for staff are things like administrative support, um, having access to the tools that you need, the materials that you need. How am I supposed to go in and function? So, you know, there are these, our, our teachers have to be front loaded. Our parents have to be front loaded um, and our, because we can't front load our kids unless we've done that work. Um, so Alyssa is asking about any specific tips or strategies you have to get buy-in. Um, Alyssa, do you want to unmute and, and talk through that question? Yeah. Um, I just find a lot of times, especially for students who are using AAC as an, um, augmentative piece, like who mm -hmm. are verbal, um, a lot of times I'll see them, you know, walking around without their talkers, without their yeah. AC. And when I like, you know, bring it up to staff, they're like, oh, well, he talks with me or, you know, yeah. he uses verbal speech a lot. There's just sometimes I feel like it's seen as just like yeah, one extra layer, one other thing I have to do. Sure. And I feel like sometimes um, getting that buy-in or getting like the staff to see the value can be difficult. Uh -huh. So I just wasn't sure if there's any like, go-to kind of like ways that you present it you know I know the uh -huh. front loading is important but just anything that you have for tips of like ways yeah. that they can see that value before actually because sometimes I you know they will see the value if those opportunities are presented yeah but sometimes those opportunities aren't presented because they don't see the value so it's just like a cycle um, yeah, and I feel like like what you said of like oh communication whisperer like I feel like sometimes we come in uh -huh. model but then it's like you know oh well you're the speech therapist like of course they're doing sure. well with yeah. you so just anything you have okay so the most effective uh strategies um that I have and I'll, and I'll, I'll give some context here you know um on my team so serving a school district of 65,000 students um there are five of us uh, for the entire district. And by the way, worked up, worked up to that, you know, from uh, starting out part time, you know, many years ago, and then working up to five people. So um, one of the things that, you know, we got to a point like with referrals and that kind of thing, where it was like a lot of like, meetings and, and, you know, so then it's just like sharing information, but not really getting to um, go into classrooms. So um, one of the things we did, for example, is develop a technical assistance model where staff could say, hey, these are my priorities of what, you know, I want help with. And then to have then uh, free up some time to go in because you're the number one thing I've ever been able to do that gets a positive, you know, and sustained response is to be with the people and model live in real time and to video. Um, and so, of course, you have to have permission, you know, make sure you have permission uh, to be able to do that. But, you know, things like people are so busy and things are kind of, you know, gone and out of the ether. But when you have something that you've been able to uh, go work with a student and capture that on video, they can review that. Um, and even when you're, so when you're getting together and meeting with people and going like, oh, okay, well, here's how I got this out of this student, even a verbal student that uses AAC, and I'll give you, an, I'll give you a specific example. I had a student, um, I'll call him um, um, Steve, and uh, he was in high school, uh, AS, uh, autism spectrum, and he had significant echolalia. 
So um, a lot of Disney vocabulary, this kind of thing. So um, and working, and I did this collaboratively and working with this team in middle school, we ended up going with um, like, a, I think we started with a 40 and then went to a 70 page uh, pod book. Because what I found is that if I was using that um, to communicate with him, I was able to get him focused on uh, whatever the topic was we were doing and off the echolalia. So sure, he was verbal, but it doesn't really help me uh, educationally when I'm just talking about Moana. You know, that's not really um, going to be functional for me. So in high school, I went into the community and I really had a fun, I really had a lot of fun doing this with him. I really like this kid. And I remember taking his pod book and his everyone got to see me in real time, go to the grocery store. He wanted to ask about flowers. He was, you know, because there's a flower display. And so using the product, we were able to go find a worker, ask some questions about flowers. And he verbalized, he wasn't using the book. He's just needed that vocabulary um, and that help uh, to be able to use functionally uh, useful verbal vocabulary. So, but the key there was to video. Now, is it all unicorns and rainbows? No. Uh, in fact, I had an occupational therapy aide come in, um, a young guy, and he saw me using the pod book uh, with, with this kiddo and said, um, we need something different. We need, he needs an iPad that is from the 80s, the, the, the book. Um, and I was like, okay. And that's the reality of the situation, right? We get something on board, we're dialed in something changes. There's a new factor. So that, that became a, that became again, a step back. I look at a problem. The problem isn't that kid. The problem isn't the system. It's like, now I have this, this barrier that I need to work with. But I, I would say that that is um, the, and cause you can't be there live all the time, but video. Thank you so much. Yeah. My daughter has echolalia. So I am, I'm familiar with this. Um, the video was a big, was a big thing. Uh huh. Um, yeah, because it's great. To hear. She'll just she'll just model or she'll just copy anything she sees uh -huh. on video. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. Yeah. So and I'm and that's for him. You know, I using I it took I think the school because I would often find that book under you know in the little basket under his desk. Um, and so then, you know, it's, again, people might not uh, initially see the value, but I'll tell you what, a few times of going in the community and why, and keeping track. So sitting down and saying, okay, I did this intervention and I took a language sample because I had that video and here's the sentences that I got out of the student using the support. So here's my language sample. So tell me, you know, like kind of, you know, what are the things he's using here? Oh, okay. Well, it looks like we've got some evidence here that this strategy actually really expands his communicative functions, and it's going to help you reach your high school goals of vocational uh, training for your functional life skills training. So while it looks like when we're using this strategy, we're going to get to those goals uh, quicker. So then um, being able to provide that evidence, but in a non-blaming uh, kind of a way. Um, so uh, Shawnee, you want to uh, ask your question about efficient communication needs and selecting AT? Sure, it's Shaney. Um, oh, I, meant to say, I apologize. That's okay. Shaney. I meant to say um, selecting um, AT at, um, when a child needs to communicate efficiently. I work with mm -hmm. five population. Okay. So um, you work with, I'm, I'm sorry, what population? The birth to five population. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of kids who um, have challenging behavior mm -hmm. that are, and it's related to things like taking toys, sure. um, trying to gain attention in inappropriate ways. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I really struggle with kind of like now tools and later tools because sure. I, you know, toddlers need things in the now things yeah. happen. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes I feel like it makes a lot of sense to teach kids um, things like, you know, simple gestures, tapping on the shoulders, um, using the open hand to ask for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hear a lot of people saying, but he needs the device or they need a sure. device. And, and I say, oh, I really think that could be beneficial for the child um, to learn language. Um, and that's something we can definitely look at. 
Uh, but I feel like uh, if we need efficient communication that meets the 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 function of the behavior, uh, teaching a device in that moment, a robust device in that moment is not going to work. And I also struggle with the idea of using something like a simple a single message voice output button um, for a child without motor needs, um, because it's not generalizable to other environments unless they have that button with them all the time, whereas they have the hand with them all the time for something mm -hmm. like gesture. If there well, is okay. So you make um, some really excellent points. Um, so, but what I would want to suggest is that none of these things are mutually exclusive, right? But what happens um, is just as I said earlier, people focus on stuff, right? And then so, um, you know, and we want all kinds of augmentative communication support. So everything you just mentioned, a digitized uh, voice output device, um, uh, gestures, May, um, some some um, just uh, picture support, uh, uh, some robust uh, language, uh, no text support, whether it's core vocabulary, pod, whatever it might be, a uh, speech generating device. Again, people, it's like a focus on the equipment. I'm not worried about the equipment, right? Because um, equipment is there, doesn't do us any good unless we're wonderful. Um, so we all have to be wonderful augmentative communicators because otherwise that's a paperweight. And there's a lot of evidence to show that. Um, and so it doesn't mean if somebody's asking about a speech generating device, I never say no. It's like, yeah, just I do just like you said and said, yeah, that's a great consideration. Now let's look at the whole toolkit of how we're teaching language and communication. I have an interesting uh, new perspective on this topic because I have a little grandson and um, he's 22 months old. So I have since birth uh, signed with him and I have used, I don't use the pod book so much anymore, but I do, occasionally I do, um, but I do use all kinds of other augmented communication supports when we're doing stuff, but he signs a ton um, and he's talking a lot. The cutest two word combination he said the other day was baby orange for a tangerine, but he signed like his con, like he, the concepts he can sign, for example, he can sign different. I learned, or he signs it like this, but um, he learned different. That's the first thing I use with him is like, he would cry. I'm like, oh, let's do something different. So to your point, sometimes that's the most efficient, effective way to communicate. He can't say the word different, but the other day we were looking at ducks and he said, he says duck, duck. And he's like, duck, duck. And I was like, oh, you're telling me that's a different duck, duck <laughs> because he's got an inventory, right? It's not mutually exclusive. He's got words, he's got signs, we've got supports. And it's the same for our kids that have complex communication needs. So I, I personally love a button. I use a button for all kinds of things with button here, button there. We're like doing repeated, you know, text, uh, you know, with books or um, maybe it's the holidays and it's trick or treat, smell my feet. Um, you know, like I like to use all these things in my inventory. But you your point about what is the what is the communication behavior that meets the need most efficiently when we have a kid with challenging behavior is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily important point. So it's got to be more efficient than the behavior. So what I would say about the speech generating device or other things is language input, right? So we're modeling these efficient ways to communicate and get our needs met, but then there's this whole thing called language. And then how are we making that accessible um, to the student? So everything that you just said goes in the toolbox and then certain things are good. And we wanna make that connection. I'm trying to get somebody's attention, but sometimes the tapping can lead into, you know, something else, right? So that's not always the most effective. So it just, it's a constant analysis of what's in that toolbox, what's most efficient, and how are we teaching language and a variety of communicative functions and what tools do the adults need? So when somebody asks about speech generating device, that's great. First thing I want to know is how am I going to get you to use that speech generating device? And then I'll worry about that kid. So I hope that helps. Yes, that's very validating. I mean, this whole presentation of um, looking at the bigger picture of the curriculum and the positive behavior supports, I feel like anytime, uh, a lot of times people reach out to me and I end up getting into that whole world and I feel like, oh, I'm stepping my toes in. I, I, I'm constantly stepping out of out of my box be, and I feel like I have to. So, so but if, if you think about your hats, right, which I'm sure you have many, like most people <laughs> have a lot of hats. So how does a speech pathologist help with behavior? Well, you know about communication. What is behavior? Communication. Now, are you going to go in and do the functional behavioral analysis? Are you going to be the BCBA? No. But are you going to help 
with uh, finding those efficient ways of communication because you are the language and communication expert. And so you have a lot of knowledge to provide. So what I'm gonna suggest too, is like when you sit down with people, just use that key, evident, partially evident, not yet evident. We got some little work, we got a little bit of work to do. Let's just get these things on board, see if we can make some quick progress. And then we can continue to make ongoing decisions for children because they're developing all the time. Thank awesome. you. Awesome, Carrie. Well, we just have about one minute left. If anybody else has any more questions, I'm happy to sit here for a little bit. <laughs> well, Carrie, I have been looking forward to your session. Uh, we know in our classrooms now, some of the um, primary themes are behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and so this addresses that. We also look at chronic absenteeism uh, for some of the same reasons. We look at trauma and what our kids are going through. So if we are going to um, help with um, the behaviors, and then we have to do the work behind it. And it's just a challenge. Uh, we've got different teams and consistencies, uh, things that are different across our districts. But it's when we come together and have conversations like this that it gives us all hope that we are on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's, again, busy people. We tend to overlook the stuff that's kind of actually like hitting us in the face of, wait a minute, um, there, here's something I could do right now today. Um, I could I could work to address this immediate problem because this strategy is not evident um, and I'm going to make a big difference because I, I, I go into classrooms all the time to do observations. I try to be very um, inclusive, collaborative. And, and when I do that, I'm not there to supervise anybody, um, but looking for those kinds of immediately solvable problems that can make a big difference. <laughs>